This week on The Climate Show, how hooking up our neighbourhoods to communal heating networks could help bring down our emissions as well as our bills. Hello and welcome to the show. This week, amongst much else, we're looking at heat networks, how communities around me are linked to the power station beneath me, and how this idea is gaining traction across many communities and could help reduce climate change emissions. Also on the programme, burning wood for power. Why one of Britain's power generators may need to rethink its renewable claims. No rain in Spain. A scorching spring heat wave sends alarm bells ringing. Extremes in California, the once drought-starved state, now bracing itself for flooding after record snowfall. And we'll hear about the pioneering conservation project helping lion numbers to recover in parts of Kenya. But first, green heating for our homes is a hot subject, with hydrogen and heat pumps dominating the debate. But I've been hearing about another option which we could be seeing a lot more of. This is Swaffham Prior, a village of 300 houses with some dating back centuries. An unexpected front runner in a renewable energy revolution. Swaffham Prior has much in common with many rural settlements off the gas grid and homes that are old, beautiful and energy inefficient. All those things make it difficult to get on the right side of the climate story. The solution is a combination of innovations, both heat pumps and district heating. This is the uh, oil tank. This is how we used to heat the home. So uh, this is basically uh, uh, redundant now. In December, Mike severed the oil pipe since he had hooked up to the district heating network. There are an estimated 1.1 million homes in England in the same boat, largely reliant on relatively dirty and often pricey oil. And that's where the village's energy centre comes in. A £12 million project built by a partnership between Cambridgeshire County Council and Bouygues Energy to alleviate pollution and fuel poverty. 15 homes are connected to this so far, but they're rolling out towards 300. So we're walking through the expansion vessels at the moment, and then we've got the air source and the ground source heat pumps contained in the building. Their energy centre, built on council land, contains ground source heat pumps fed from boreholes in the field and air source pumps too. At the moment, these use electricity from the grid, but by the summer, they'll be almost entirely fed from a nearby solar farm. This is a hot water system. We're taking water here, we're taking it to 75 degrees, and then we're pumping it around the village in a series of pipe networks to people's homes. So what's all around me here is basically replacing 300 units in individual homes. Yes, basically. It's much more efficient. It means that um, when technologies change in, say, don't know, 40, 50 years, we only have to change the technology here in the energy centre. All the pipe network stays in the village and the heat interface unit is already installed in people's homes. When you've been a bit of a pioneer and this is the first of its kind, people are naturally nervous. They're very used to oil. So actually proving them that they could be a different path and it's an easy path is something that we're working hard to do. So this is where all the <laughs> The new equipment is the understairs cupboard. Uh, mind your head. So you didn't need to change anything on the inside of the house? The radiators out there, this pipe work was all the same? It's the old uh, radiator and hot water piping that, that was already in the house. And the scheme is designed so that it can be retrofitted into houses with minimal amount of internal alteration. Do you have control? There's a, a thermostat that sits in the living room uh, and, you know, we can set that like a, any normal uh, heating system. The idea of district heating, a central heat source which pipes hot water to homes, is common in continental Europe with around 12% of homes kept warm that way. But district heating isn't always attached to low carbon heat sources. Thank you. Here in South London, rubbish is power. 
Unrecycled waste is burned to make electricity. We process approximately 1,300 tonnes of waste today. So this is the combustion grate where the waste is processed. Ooh. About how hot? About 1,000 degrees C. Uh, unlike most power stations, which just use that heat to create steam and make a turbine to make electricity, this place uses the heat as well to heat local properties. These incinerators, or energy from waste plants, as the industry prefers, are big sources of CO2 and air pollution. But they say using their waste heat, which would otherwise drift skywards, improves their climate performance. So this is the start of the district heating network, and this is where the hot loop leg goes out into the local borough for a few kilometres and returns back in again. So this is literally like the hot water pipe for how many homes around here? About 2,600 homes. This is a low carbon solution and it replaces the need to have fossil fuels such as gas used to heat those homes for the hot water as well. You say it's low carbon. I mean, stuff is still being burnt, of course. There is still carbon dioxide coming off here. So in what way is it low carbon? So processing waste at an energy from waste plant displaces the need of sending that waste to landfill. So by processing it, we're actually making use of that waste that is non-recyclable. They have plans to join up a further 18,000 homes locally as they still have heat to spare. But that does mean digging up the streets and agreement from the council. District heating provides about 2 to 3 per cent of heat for UK buildings at the moment. Uh, the government target is that it should reach about 18 to 20 per cent by 2050, so about 10 times the amount, but also it could be more. Most of Europe's district heating systems have a fossil fuel at their core, and here the government's recent promise of £220 million for heat networks wasn't limited to funding those based on renewables. One of the great things about district heating is that whilst they can use uh, high carbon fuel sources and a lot of them are on gas CHP at the moment, you can then transition them by changing just the energy centre and then use the same pipes and the same heat to the house uh, but from a low carbon source. Heating networks are more efficient than a boiler in every home and those with a renewable hub are very climate friendly. Using and not wasting heat from existing fossil fuel power generators has to be positive but questionable as a justification for their expansion. Now, as you've heard there, waste to energy plants like this one are making green claims despite still having pretty high carbon emissions. But the power station Drax goes further. It burns wood for energy and says that is renewable. But as Victoria Seabrook has been discovering, its own advisers are saying they might have to call time on that claim. These domes may look unassuming, but what's inside fuels controversy. Wood pellets that are burned to create electricity. In theory, that's renewable because new trees grow in their place, absorbing any emissions. But the science is hotly contested. Now the UK's largest provider, Drax, has been told by its own scientific advisers to stop calling biomass carbon neutral. Drax has been running for, for, for a decade and the whole, the whole premise on which Drax was converted to biomass and bioenergy uh, and the basis on which it's been given government subsidies for doing that was that that, that bioenergy is, is very low carbon or, or, or zero carbon and so to be opening that question up uh, now uh, is certainly a surprising uh, development. The government gives Drax £1.7 million a day in subsidies for generating electricity it classes as green. Questioning that isn't going to appeal to ministers. It could mean adding more emissions onto our tally just as we're trying to cut them, putting our net zero climate target further out of reach. It also makes it harder to argue for more subsidies when they expire in four years' time. Drax says it may not survive without them and that it's always improving its evidence. A spokesperson said, The science that underpins our approach is complicated, nuanced and evolves, and we take our responsibility to develop our explanation of it very seriously. Biomass is useful, providing 6% of our electricity, and it's flexible, but it's not our only option. There are lots of different renewable technologies out there um, that are low cost and proven, so from solar, wind, hydrogen. Maybe as we determine that the biomass is less 
carbon neutral than, than we previously thought, we should be reducing that reliance and reducing how much uh, we're using biomass uh, post-2027. The government is working on a new biomass strategy, but with a debate raging over the climate impact, it's under much more pressure to get it right. Now, it may only be April, but Spain has been experiencing alarmingly high temperatures of the sort that are normally felt in July or August. On Thursday, the mercury hit a blistering 38.8 degrees in Cordoba, the highest temperature ever recorded in the country in April. It comes at the same time that reservoirs are at a fraction of their normal levels after the driest March in 20 years. We've become familiar with stories of wildfires and drought in California, but now there's a danger of flooding as record snowfall over winter has become snowpack in the mountains, which is now starting to melt. Mammoth Lakes is a town entombed by a snowpack three times the historical average. In the space of several months, California has swung from severe drought to extreme winter storms. This is what that looks like in the mountains. Everything here is buried. For the skiers and snowboarders, it's a boon. But for locals, it's a slow motion disaster. That just um, collapsed. It wasn't even an explosion. Barely a house here is undamaged. Steve's own home has become an igloo of sorts. We just now got sunlight in here. It's so heartbreaking. Many, many, countless homes are going to take on water. Over, um, you know, months, it's like being squeezed by an anaconda. And we kept screaming, help us, um, nobody cut the damn head off. But people here know this is a catastrophe of two parts, and the worst is likely yet to come. Because these walls, with the rising temperatures, are starting to melt. And they're sending torrents of water downstream. The snow-capped mountains are a spectre of doom in California's Central Valley. Near-record rainfall has already seen the rebirth of Tulare Lake for the first time in decades. This was dry land, beneath the waves, acres of farmland. Tulare Lake hasn't just been resurrected, it's reappeared with a vengeance. It now covers 30 square miles, resembling a vast inland sea. And over the next couple of months, this could grow to 200 square miles. Whatever was planted there is, is gone, it's been destroyed. Bob has already lost 900 acres of farmland to the lake. Now he's worried the deluge from the snowmelt could threaten his 20,000 cattle too. It is very, very serious. This, this is an historic event. We were in such a severe drought here in California, so you, know, you, you, you pray for the rain. <laughs> And now all of a sudden you're praying for it not to rain and you're praying for it to be cool to where the snow melt doesn't come down all at one time. This is now a disaster zone and the state's governor is under pressure to shore up defences. There's not a climate expert, you know, there's not a meteorologist that doesn't say the following. We've never seen this at this level of intensity and extreme. Do you wonder what has to happen for people to believe in climate change? I just uh, visit California. California is emerging from a decade of drought to different extreme weather. The Golden State has now become the sodden state with even more water on the way. And for people here, that is a terrifying prospect. Martha Kellner, Sky News, California's Central Valley. Another place particularly vulnerable to climate change is Pakistan, hit by devastating floods six months ago, which inundated one third of the whole country. Well, an organisation still helping the 20 million people in need is the International Rescue Committee, and their president, David Miliband, joins me now from New York. David, you've just returned from Pakistan. Tell me, what did you see and hear? Well, the immediate visible signs of the appalling floods last summer have disappeared, but the deeper scars are still there. Remember, a third of the country was underwater at last 
year. Now the floods have receded in the vast majority of the country, but 10 million people are still displaced. The economic suffering as a result of the floods is still very much there. And what does it actually look like now the water's receded? I mean, can you sort of still see the damage? And, and what does it mean in terms of people's lives six months on? So in the fields, you can't see the, the harvest that was lost. You can talk to farmers about how they lost everything, how they lost their assets, how they lost livestock. In the urban areas, there is a, a massive reconstruction job. It's been estimated by the World Bank at around 15 or $16 billion just of physical infrastructure. And so as you go around the country, there's undoubtedly a sense uh, from what people can see that we're in a new age. Are they think, trying to rebuild in a way that makes it a bit more disaster proof or, if you like, uh, climate change ready? There's a clear ambition that they adapt the way in which they're developing. But that is much easier said than done. And it's much easier said than paid for. And so the uh, thought that needs to go into what does it mean for an agricultural economy to be adapted and insulated, if you like, against the climate crisis? What does it mean for the urban areas? Remember, it's 240 million people in Pakistan. Uh, what does it mean for urban areas to be properly insulated? Is a massive challenge. There was a lot of talk around the time of the climate meeting COP in Egypt about, uh, uh, about justice and, and payment for other countries because of the climate change that we in the rich and north have caused. Does Pakistan feel like a justified recipient of that money to you? Totally. I mean, they, you can't have a conversation in Pakistan without someone saying, look, we're 0.5% of all global emissions, yet we're in the eye of the storm when it comes to the consequences of greenhouse gas emissions for the global atmosphere. I, I think there's three parts of it. They want one, they want help to, be, to develop their economy in a way that is low carbon. Secondly, they want to insulate their society from the wider effects of climate change. That's called adaptation. They also say, you mentioned the word justice, they also say there needs to be preparation for the loss and damage that comes from uh, climate change. And there needs to be money for when things go wrong. And, David, what's the situation in East Africa? I've seen a report out this week that says the ongoing drought has been made 100 times more likely because of climate change. They've had five, and they're on the verge of six failed rains. That means nearly three years of failed rains. And that's contributed substantially both to a loss of um, uh, production, agricultural production, um, so the domestic production, especially of basic foodstuffs, is down. And the war in Ukraine has made it a double whammy because that's raised global grain and wheat prices. A country like Somalia is 90% dependent. And so organizations like the International Rescue Committee, we're actually on the front line now in, in, in Somalia, in parts of Ethiopia, in parts of Kenya as well, where the climate crisis is contributing to a food crisis, which is contributing to a malnutrition crisis. Well, sobering news about how climate change is affecting millions of people there. And David mentioned the drought in East Africa. And after the break, we'll hear how that is impacting both wildlife, particularly lions, and many of the people who share the land with them. Welcome back to The Climate Show. Now, this week saw the 30th anniversary of the Whitley Awards. Now, they celebrate people protecting nature and wildlife right across the world with really good community-led projects. I caught up with their Gold Award winner, Shivani Bala, who's been protecting lions in Kenya and also heard about some of the other award winners. This marine biologist has a passion for protecting the nocturnal seabirds of the Mexican Pacific Islands. This conservation leader has helped the population of Kazakhstan's extraordinary saiga antelope increase 20-fold. They are just some of the wildlife champions receiving this year's awards, and the top award went to Shivani Bala for reversing the decline of lions in part of Kenya. Last year was a record-breaking year. We recorded 50 lions within the area we cover, and it's the highest lion number we've had since 2008. So it's really exciting for us. And what do you put that success down to? It's the communities themselves leading the conservation efforts. It's our team of warriors who are from that region, tracking lions, knowing exactly where they are, and communicating that message to livestock herders to avoid those areas. 
It's women who are involved in conservation as well. We have a great Mama Simba program where women are taking the lead to decide what is best for their land and their wildlife. They have this cultural belief that wildlife belong to them anyway. What's brought people and wildlife into conflict particularly recently? We live and work along this spectacular river called the Iwaso Nira River. But since 2009, it's, been dry, it's drying up every single year. Climate change? Climate change, definitely. A river that dries up basically leads to people, their livestock and wildlife all converging into very few areas where they might find a little bit of water. Lions will often be lying in those bushes. They'll come across some lost livestock or some weak livestock. It's easy prey for lions. And understandably, when lions kill cows or camels, the communities do get very upset and will retaliate and shoot lions. Uh, I mean, maybe this is too trite, but is it a bit about making warrior pride, male pride, attached to conserving lions rather than hunting lions? Absolutely. They're very proud in what they do. We've evaluated this program, and it's really socially and politically empowered the warriors. They feel like they're doing something really great for their community. With the profile and funding from the award, Shivani hopes to train 150 community leaders to spread her successful conservation techniques in Kenya and farther afield. A crucial project as lions across much of the continent are still in great peril. Now, one thing known to cause damage to nature is the widespread use of herbicides to protect food crops. But one machine may eliminate the need to do that. Dan Whitehead has more. In the Gloucestershire countryside, the vines are budding. But deep in Three Choirs Vineyard, there is science underway. A new method of controlling weeds is being tested. No herbicides being sprayed or roots dug up. Instead, it uses electricity. Each of these flaps contain electrodes, and as electricity passes through them, it completes a circuit, and the heat generated essentially frazzles any weeds that they come into contact with. The device, Root Wave, has been designed in conjunction with Coventry University. The system could mean an end to herbicides that could be damaging to the environment and potentially our health. Chemicals are going up in price all the time. Where we will be 10 or 15 years from now, I can't begin to imagine. We've used glyphosate weed killer for 30 years here, um, and I think it's time that we, uh, we found um, opportunities to, uh, to change from that and move on. The use of herbicides and pesticides in the UK is in the spotlight, especially since Brexit and bans imposed in EU countries. The challenge is finding an alternative to chemicals that work on the same scale for farmers. We have better weed control in fewer treatments. So uh, from an operational point of view, uh, it's actually easier to, to, to manage as a farmer. Uh, in addition, we don't have the issues such as the high wind that you do with uh, herbicides. So the farmer has more choice when and where to weed. The Soil Association says previous trials of electric weed killing showed no damage to soil biology. With this product available from the summer, blasting weeds with electric rather than chemicals could be the latest climate-friendly alternative. Dan Whitehead, Sky News, in Gloucestershire. Now, before we go, just a reminder that you can catch up on all things climate and environment on the Sky News website and app by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. We're off for a short break before coming back on May the 20th for our long summer run. See you then.